So the last thing I want to talk about today is kind of a, a giant caveat to everything else I'm going to talk about this semester. So we're going to talk all semester long about all the differences, the amazing variation and diversity of living things. All of that diversity is the icing on the cake, but it's not the cake. Most of what makes life what it is on this planet is the same regardless of organisms. I'm trying to remember, um, it may have been either Polly or um, Francis Crick who said, what's true for E. coli is true for elephants. Justifying the study of bacteria to study macroscopic things. And it's true, most of what we know about human metabolism doesn't come from studying humans, does it? It comes from studying other organisms. You probably have no idea how fundamental the similarity is. Realistically speaking, organisms are 99.9 something percent similar to each other regardless of whether it's E. coli, yeast, humans, whatever. And there's a really easy way to look at this is to think about the central dogma. You guys have seen this a million times. DNA, which is replicated, is transcribed to make RNA, a little bit of reverse transcription. That RNA is a, is a protein synthesis machinery that makes protein, and protein has function. Now, there are little, little evasions and tricks to all this. That's fine. We'll talk about some of those. In every one of these cases, you can look at how similar they are in all organisms. So let's start with DNA. All organisms have DNA. Um, I'm going to leave viruses to a single lecture later in the semester. Whether they're organisms or not is an interesting question. But thinking about cellular organisms, all of them have DNA. And it's not just any DNA. It's always deoxyribose. There are hundreds of isomers of, of pentose. All organisms use deoxyribose, two prime deoxyribose for their DNA. It turns out you can make nice double stranded helical things with base pairs out of other kinds of things as well. You can make them out of glycerol, replace the pentose with glycerol. You can make it with peptides. But organisms don't do this. They always use 2 prime deoxyribose. The bases that make up the base pairs are always the same. G, A, C, and T. That's it. There are lots and lots of other bases. Xanthine, hypoxanthine. The list goes on and on and on and on. None of them are used in DNA for coding information. They appear in weird situations once in a while. G, A, T, and C. That's it. There's no conceptual reason why you couldn't have another kind of base pair, not just G, C, and A, T, but you can have other kinds of bases, another purine and another pyrimidine, and put them together, and it works just fine. But organisms don't do that. The code in that DNA is always the same, with only minor recent exceptions. A, A, A codes for lysine. The code is three letters in a row, not four, not two, three. And the code is the same. AAA equals lysine. CCC is, I think, proline. And so forth. You can recode that. People have gone through and recoded DNA with different tRNAs, and it works just fine. There's no fundamental reason why AAA has to be lysine and not anything else. But in all living things, it is. In all organisms, that DNA has the same function. It's opened up, made, a made into a RNA copy in pieces, and that RNA does stuff. What about those RNAs? Once again, the same pentose sugar, ribose, D-ribose. None of the other 100 isomers of, 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 of pentoses are used. No hexoses are used. No trioses, nothing. It's always D-ribose. Same four bases, G, A, C, and U. They're the same kinds of RNAs. So what kinds of RNAs do I mean? Ribosomal RNAs, large and small subunit, bunch of tRNAs, typically an SR, a signal recognition particle RNA, maybe a tmRNA, RNAs pRNA, 
bunch of regulatory RNAs, messenger RNAs, the same in all organisms. These two diagrams are two RNAs. These are the small subunit ribosomal RNAs from Homo sapiens and Escherichia coli. Not really very much different. About 25% of the nucleotides in this are identical. Some of the sequences, there's some sequences right in here where the decoding center is, right up here, that are identical in nearly every living thing there is. These, these nucleotide sequences are at least 3.8 billion years old. The RNAs have the same structure, the same function in all living things. Proteins. These are the purpose of these RNAs is to make proteins, and these, those proteins are made from peptides, or, the, or I should say, amino acids into peptides, long peptides, polypeptides, with the same 20 amino acids. Now, some organisms have a couple of extra that they use once in a while, including humans, by the way, um, selenocysteine, for example, um, or pyrolysine. Um, but the same 20 amino acids make up the vast majority of all proteins. The same, the same chirality of those amino acids, the same ones are all, always L amino acids. There, there are a couple of places where D amino acids are used, for example, in bacterial cell walls, um, but not by translation. Those proteins have the same structure. They're all peptides, right? made in the same way, with the same conformation, and most of the and same post-translational modifications, things like phosphorylations and adenylations and acetylations, that sort of thing. And most of the proteins are the same in different organisms. Glyceraldehyde, right? It, it's, like a, it's like a wrench. It's, it fulfills the same function in every organism, and it really doesn't matter um, what sequence it is or anything like that. It, it's, 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 it's a tool, and it's found in, in nearly all organisms. These enzymes have the same three-dimensional structures in, in, in different organisms and similar sequences and similar mechanism of action. If you look at glyceraldehyde phosphate dehydrogenase from E. coli and from Homo sapiens, metabolically they do the same thing, biochemically they do the same thing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And those proteins, those enzymes, come together to generate metabolic pathways from small molecules or sometimes large are transformed through a long series of chemical reactions from one thing to another by these pathways, which are the same in all living organisms, with minor exceptions. Glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, amino acid biosynthetic pathways, um, cofactor biosynthetic pathways. These, these are the same with minor modifications in all living things. Now, sometimes they're missing in particular organisms. That's why you have amino acids that you need to get in your diet, right? Because animals don't know how to make lysine. But those pathways have been lost. But in organisms that have the pathway, they make it the same way. The fundamental structure of living things is the same in everywhere. Living things are made of cells, where you've got an inside, a lipoprotein membrane, and an outside. That seems obvious. What else could you do? How about having a surface with a bleb on it where there is cells and cell stuff, cytoplasm, a membrane on one side, but a substrate on the other? As far as we know, in biology, that's never happened. So all the living things are made of cells. What does this mean? I mean, if organisms are... are if the vast majority of how organisms are built and how they work are the same, it's got to mean something, right? So there are two things that I think it means. Number one, most of evolution occurred before the last common ancestor of all the things we know about on Earth. Because we inherited all these features, right? E. coli has DNA because all of its ancestors had DNA. And we have DNA because all, all of our ancestors had DNA. 
And we both had that because the common ancestor between E. coli and Homo sapiens had DNA. All living things on Earth, at least all the ones we know of, have a single common ancestor. At least ancestral population, which is a better way of thinking about it. And that common ancestral population was pretty complicated. It could do all this stuff, and it had all these features. So all of these features evolved before that last common ancestor, before all the diversification that we see today. It all probably happened very quickly, by the way, within maybe 100 million years. We'll talk about that later. So most of evolution occurred, at least most of biochemical structural evolution occurred before the last common ancestor. All living things have a single common ancestry at least all the organisms that we've identified on this planet. And that last common ancestor was a pretty complicated, sophisticated organism, probably not very different than a lot of organisms that exist today. And all the diversity that we see, all the differences, all the stuff we're going to talk about for the next 16 weeks is that icing that goes beyond that. But never forget that organisms are fundamentally all the same. All right. Next time, we're going to talk about the evolution of evolutionary thought, taxonomy and phylogeny, etc. There's a specific reason why I talk about these things. You know, a lot of classes they do the historical thing, and everyone phases it out and forgets about it. Um, it turns out, though, that the hardest part about learning something new—that's the point of this class, right? Learn something new. The hardest part about learning something new isn't learning something new. The hardest part is letting go of stuff you think you already know. And that's what I want to do in the next lecture. I want you to forget about up higher and lower eukaryotes. I want you to forget about prokaryotes and invertebrates. I want you to forget about the ladder of life. All that kind of stuff. All right? And I'm going to show you why those things should be forgotten next time. All right, I'll see you either in, in lab, um, either today or tomorrow for in, in most cases.